Welcome everyone to another episode of Eat Sleep Drive. Now recently I did a video where I was talking about some surprisingly cheap sports cars at every price range, everything from $10,000 to $50,000. And that video went over really well and one of the first comments that I got on that video was, can you do a video like this but for all cars under $10,000? So that's what this video is gonna be five cars, five unique sports cars under $10,000. So when I say unique, uh, the whole point of this video is not to pick the obvious choices. Miatas, Corvettes, Mustangs, like stuff like that. They're not, they're great cars, not that interesting for this video. I want to showcase some cars that you can pick up affordably under 10 grand and they're like really fun and unique. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And let's just dive straight in to uh, my picks here. We're gonna start with two German cars, then we'll do two Japanese cars, and then back to a German car. The first car is none other than the C55 AMG. Not too many people know about this car. It was only produced for two years in 2005 and 2006, and they didn't bring a whole lot of them to the States. So I think that's why a lot of people don't know about them. But they're really cool cars, obviously based on the C-Class of the Mercedes of that era. These cars have a 362 horsepower engine, V8, and it goes zero to 60 in sub five seconds, like 4.8 seconds. So it's a properly quick car, especially for that time period, like 2005, 2006. So the nice part about AMGs or this specific AMG, not all AMGs, uh, this one specifically is that they're really actually pretty reliable. So this engine is, this virtually the same engine that's in the E55, which is a car that I had last year. Except it's not supercharged. In the E55 AMG, this engine was supercharged. In this car, it's not. So it's just a naturally aspirated V8. And other than dealing with like oil leaks and stuff like that, you're gonna be pretty reliable with these cars and the transmission is known to be bulletproof. They're not exciting transmissions by any means. You can only get them in automatics and they're a regular slush box, but uh, it's basically indestructible. So what you're gonna, like the selling points for this are V8 engines, sounds amazing, makes a whole bunch of horsepower, pretty reliable and it's a good looking car. Being that this is a 2005, 2006, like it still looks relatively modern, right? So here's an example of one. This is, uh, you know, once again, we're doing all under 10,000. This is just under $10,000. But this actually looks like a pretty nice example. Curated by me, of course, no accidents, two owner car. Um, that's pretty interesting. And this thing just ha has just over 100,000 miles. So really not too bad. I'm not in super love with this color. It's fine. Uh, but you know, ideally I would try and get one in a different color that stands out more, but that's kind of the nice part about this is you could blend in kind of and not get pulled over in this car uh, because it's just sort of, for the most part, looks like another Mercedes. But these things are incredible and no one really talks about them or knows about them. I've actually thought about buying one next and I'm probably going to ruin that by making this video because maybe some other people are going to try and buy them and buy up all the ones that I want. But <laughs> regardless, let's move on to the next car. Another German car, as I said, the BMW 128i. Another car that I don't hear people talk about a whole lot, but they're really fun to drive. Smaller, um, obviously a coupe. The one series was made for a couple years certainly more than the uh, C55 was. The nice part about the 128s is you, there's a lot of them for sale. There are a fair number that are manual and you're gonna wanna get the manual one because that's what's really fun about this car. So whereas the C55 is a V8 and it's more of kind of like a cruiser, more GT car, uh, I'm gonna say the 128 is a little more pure sports car in the sense of, you know, it's just more fun to drive. It's definitely gonna be lighter. Um, it doesn't have, as much horsepower, but it's got a super smooth BMW inline straight six. So 230 horsepower to this bad boy. And here's a nice example of one. Once again, I mentioned that if you search for these cars, they're all over the place and they're all under 10 grand. So this one's seven grand, which I think is pretty crazy. It has 86,000 miles on it. 
And once again, no accidents. This is a three owner car, title checks out. I like this color, this gray color, looks pretty good. And this one um, is a manual transmission. You'll be able to find a lot of automatics super cheap. There's not as many manuals super cheap, but that's definitely what you're gonna wanna get is the uh, manual transmission. Ideally, you could get the sport package in this. You'll know that by the seats look a little different. Um, they have like adjustable bolstering. The steering wheel looks different and the sport package, you're at, the suspension's actually a little bit lower too. There's a decent amount of aftermarket support for these and they're just like fun, pure sports cars. And before anyone talks about horrible BMW reliability, you're right. Um, the reason I wouldn't recommend a 135 is because that had the N54 engine, which is twin turbocharged, which is sort of a masterpiece, but hideously unreliable. This has the N52 engine. It's a naturally aspirated um, engine of that BMW's time period. And once again, other than like oil leaks and stuff, they're actually pretty reliable. Sometimes you might have to deal with Vanos issues, but they're really not too, too bad. Uh, you might have to replace a window regulator too because it's a BMW, but hey, it's only got two windows because it's a coupe, so you don't have to worry about four doors like you would in a 3 Series. So uh, great car, would highly recommend those, driven them, really, really like them. Moving on to our two Japanese cars. Uh, this one, this next one is near and dear to my heart because I own one currently. So I sort of put my money where my mouth is. And that is none other than the Scion FRS. Yes, you can actually buy an FRS for sub, sub $10,000. I did, mine was under $10,000. And here's an example of another one that's under $10,000. Everyone wants to hate on this car because it doesn't make a ton of power, but it's just so fun and so balanced and so easy to drive at the limit. Um, I drive mine every day and I, every time I get it, I have a good time. I really do. The only thing that bums me out about the power is not the total amount of power, but there's this little like torque dip from like three to four and a half thousand where you're kind of revving, you're feeling torque, and then it kind of dips down and it feels slower and then it gets faster again. It's, it's a really weird sensation. It's, pretty much the only Achilles heel to this car, if you can even call it Achilles heel. It's a minor annoyance. You can kind of fix it with some tuning and some aftermarket. Speaking of aftermarket, these cars obviously have a significant amount of aftermarket support. So if you're certain, if you're certainly looking for something to tune or whatever, it's going to be hard to beat an FRS. But this is a nice example, just under 10 grand. Um, but I picked it because it's, it's got 71,000 miles, which really isn't too bad. Um, the, you will be able to find some cheaper f that are automatics, but this one is an actual proper, proper manual transmission, which is what well, you're going to want to get. Come on. It's an FRS. Um, and these cars will just do everything. Like it's got more space than a Miata. So you can, it's more usable, like the back seat folds down and stuff like that. And they're cheap. They're fun. Uh, they're pretty reliable. The early ones have what some people will claim is a, a valve spring issue. Um, more people have had problems getting it fixed than not. So I'm not going to touch mine. My car has around 70,000 miles as well. Runs great. So highly recommend FRSs. And yes, they're under 10 grand now, which I think is pretty crazy. So moving on to our second Japanese car, we have the Nissan 350Z. Now the 350Z, I, I wanted to get the 370Z on this video, but they're not quite under 10 grand. Like you could find some real rough ones under 10 grand, but they're getting awfully close. So keep that in mind, the 370Z, if you can pony up a, a couple more grand, you could, find, you could find one. But the 350Z all day under 10 grand. I mean, they're so cheap. This is another car you can find a whole lot of. Uh, there are gonna be a lot of automatics, so you're gonna have to look out for that. You're definitely gonna want the manual transmission. But the biggest problem with 350Zs is not the cars themselves. The cars themselves are really good. Uh, the engines put up with a lot of abuse, despite what people say. The only issues they really have are oil consumption and like cam sensors and stuff like that, but nothing like catastrophic that isn't fairly easily remedied. The problem with 350Zs are the owners. <laughs> um, these cars have gotten so cheap and the type of person they attract is basically broke dicks looking for a fun sports car. 
So let's just scroll through Facebook here, and I just want to show you what I'm talking about. Literally just just typed in 350Z in the marketplace. First one I see has these like hideous uh, headlight covers, which are just absolutely terrible. Um, this one has some stupid sticker, and oh my god, I have no idea what's going on with this wheel situation. <laughs> like, what wheels are on the back of this car that make it so sunken? Good Lord. Um, so yeah, so the problem you're going to have to look out for, oh, here we go. Straight Fast and the Furious spec. This one has underglow lighting. I think you guys get the point of what I'm talking about. So the hardest part you're going to have finding a, a decent 350Z is one that hasn't been modified and hasn't been just screwed over by some moron. So if you can find that and you have the money, um, I would try and find a 06, 07 because they got a power bump. And they kind of sorted a little more issues around that time. The 06s and 07s make over 300 horsepower. The earlier ones were around 280. Um, still, you know, early ones are going to be just fine. That's plenty of horsepower for these cars. They're fun to drive. The steering's really good. Um, you could slide them around. You could drive them neat. Um, I think they look pretty cool. And, yeah, I mean, they're just, like, stupid cheap. For what they are you know it, well, this was not a, a cheap car brand new and they've just depreciated like crazy so find uh find yourself a clean one this one isn't too hideously modified other than i can't believe people who like sell stuff and or post photos of their car for sale with a whole bunch of trash in their car but if you can find a clean one um buy it they're pretty cool so the last car we are going back to our start of the Germans. The last car is German. It's also convertible because I figured I should probably throw a convertible in this mix if somebody really wants a convertible. And I'm also going to caveat it and say that this is not for the faint of heart in the sense of I would recommend you be mechanically inclined if you buy this car, this next car. None other than the Porsche Boxer. So the Boxer is, of course, the Cayman's brother or sister, depending on how you want to define it. And it is a great car. Like it's, it's kind of, of the Miata and FRS mentality in the sense of it's real balanced, um, relatively lower horsepower. Although the Boxer S got 250 horsepower in the early versions. And, you know, it's a mid engine sports car made by Porsche and it's 110 grand. So you have to realize that there are some caveats to that as far as like reliability and stuff like that. Of course, the biggest thing that people will talk about with any Porsche of this era is the IMS bearing. Not going to go into all the technical details, but there's a bearing that is basically behind the clutch and everything that you need to replace on these. Otherwise, it will grenade the engine. So most people replace them when they replace the clutch. Or if you're going to go in there and replace them, you know, just proactively, just to be safe, you might as well replace the clutch. It's really not that hideously expensive. I mean, in the grand scheme of $8,500 car, it is expensive. It's going to run you a couple, like two to three grand maybe. So it's it's expensive. But, you know, if you look at buying this car for $8,500 and putting two grand into it, you know, you're at just over 10 grand and you have a somewhat sorted car in the sense of it's not going to totally grenade itself. You're still going to run into issues because it's a German Porsche from the early 2000s. But once again, recommend it as a someone who is a wrench and can kind of do their own work. But I mean, this is clearly like a well-kept example. It's got more miles on it, but you know, as long as cars have been maintained properly um, and you know, they just look like they were cared for, I don't have a problem with mileage personally. Uh, this seems like a screaming deal to me. I'm surprised somebody hasn't swooped it up. It was only posted less than a week ago, so um, that's probably why. But uh, $8,500, love the red. Um, you know, it's a convertible, it's a Porsche. Uh, I, I don't know how much more you guys want for the money. I think this is a great way to end uh, you know, this, this whole video is cause you can, it really just goes to show how much car you can actually get for the money. And it's just for me, like I would rather buy this than something like a Miata just cause it's a little different. Um, I mean, you still see boxers around, but it's a little different and still just as balanced and, and fun to drive. So, 
Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Would you include any other cars on this list? There certainly are plenty of other cars, don't get me wrong, that fall under the $10,000 price range and are good sports cars. These are just some of my favorite. Uh, these are just some that I've driven and I really like. Um, most of these I've factored in, I factored reliability into uh, consideration. Once again, even though I picked some German cars, I tried to pick the ones that are traditionally more reliable than some of their uh, counterparts. So, you know, keep that in mind. And also, you know, it's kind of a unique list of cars, right? So uh, it's not just, once again, your Corvettes, your Miatas. It, this stuff's a little different, um, especially the C55. Like you just never, ever see those. So go check out some cheap sports cars. Go buy one. It's the new year. It's tax season. So what better time for this video? I appreciate you guys watching as always. If you want to follow me in between episodes and see what I'm up to, check me out on Instagram at eatsleepdrivetv. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you guys on the next one. See ya.